everyone, uh, today I'm going to show you how to make one of these uh, little VU meters. They're battery powered and rechargeable, and they connect to Wi-Fi for control purposes. They both use an INMP441 digital microphone, so their audio response is much cleaner than using a, an analog mic. Uh, and they both run from an ESP32. Best of all, uh, the code, the STL files, and the parts list are all available on GitHub at the link in the description. So if you have a 3D printer and you want to make one of these yourself, let me show you how I did it. I started by modeling all of the parts in Fusion 360. Here you can see the 8x8 version, and hopefully you can see the way everything's arranged as a sandwich, with the front layer, then the acrylic glass, then the baffle grid, then the LED matrix, and then finally the back layer, which contains all of the electronics. There are holes here for a micro USB lead to charge the battery, a power switch, and there's a tiny port on the top uh, for the I2S microphone. The layout for the 16x16 version is similar, with the only difference being really that it's a lot bigger. Printing out everything for the small version took about seven and a half hours, and I think it took about 21 hours in total for the large version. Um, it would be a lot quicker if you made the grid for the large version via laser cutting, but I don't have access to one of those at the moment. Anyway, let, now let's have a look at the real parts, and we'll start with the 8x8. Here I have the case parts for the 8x8 VU meter. Uh, originally, I printed this grid uh, here in grey, but on testing, it became apparent that in thin layers, uh, this grey PLA is actually translucent, and I was letting light bleed through from one pixel to the next. So with it reprinted in black like this, uh, that problem went away. Uh, this is the diffuser I'm using. It's simply a piece of A4 paper, or was A4 paper, cut down to size. And um, the front plastic is a piece of 2mm thick acrylic, and this is um, 82 by 82 millimeter. Uh, eventually I might swap over to using uh, frosted acrylic, uh, but this is what we've got for now, so I'm going to go with that. So we put the acrylic in first and snap that into place. So. And then the next layer is going to be the uh, diffuser, so that piece of paper can go in after that. Should all fit nicely. Uh, and then the grid is going to go in after that. So you can see there's some slight little cutouts here on the, the top of the grid, and that's to go over the resistors that are on the LED matrix. So I'm going to pop that into position as well. And uh, yeah, that should, uh, that should work nicely. The electronics for the 8x8 uh, consists mainly of things I had left over from other projects. Uh, this is the matrix itself, which I got from eBay for about £12, uh, but they are available from many other sellers and for less on AliExpress. Uh, it measures 80 by 80 millimeters and has the input in the bottom left down here. Uh, you can see on the back they've joined together the uh, the 5 volt and ground connections here to the solder pads. However, um, at only 64 LEDs, there shouldn't be much of a voltage drop on this from one end to the other, uh, but I thought I might as well do it anyway. It's not exactly difficult to do. This board here is a 2 amp um, combined battery charger and 5 volt boost circuit. And what this does, it takes 3.7 volts from the LiPo battery and makes that usable by the LEDs. Now this module must have a battery connected to it in order to function and it's vital that you set this up and adjust the voltage output using this little uh, potentiometer here before you connect other components to it because otherwise it could output more than 5 volts and damage them. Uh, we also have a power switch here and a uh, LiPo battery. And this is the most important part, which is the INP441 uh, MEMS microphone. I'm trying to get that to focus there for you. Um, although this microphone is much more complicated to connect up um, and sample from in the code than the analog mics, the payoff for that is that it's incredibly clean uh, in its output and much, much better, much nicer to use than any other analog microphone I've used previously. This means that it needs less filtering uh, in software, and the code to set one of these up, thankfully, has already been written by people far cleverer than me. Uh, on the screen now, you can see how everything is connected together, so pause the video here if you want to take a look at that. We can build that up in the moment, but first let's have a look at its big brother here. Uh, the parts and the electronics are pretty similar, except I'm using a, a larger battery, so this is a uh, 3000 milliamp hour LiPo. Again, I'd, pro I'd prefer to have something a bit bigger than this, but this is what I've got to hand at the moment. And I'm also using a slightly different um, charge and boost controller just here. And the reason I'm using this one is apparently this one works up to um, three amps. Again, I'll believe that when I actually see it. In theory, this panel here could actually draw up to 15 amps if you ran this at maximum power, maximum brightness, and all white. Um, I'm not gonna be running it anywhere near that kind of current. Looking at the patterns that I've written and um, the brightness that it's set at, I'm averaging about two to two and a half amps. So again, we'll see if this actually works, see if this can cope with that. And this does unfortunately come with a uh, USB port soldered to the side of it just here. So then I had to desolder that before I can use this because I don't want to have to plug something into the USB socket. Bit of a pain to desolder, to be honest with you. There's a big ground plane inside here, so it makes it really difficult to actually uh, remove the solder. But did manage it eventually, and it doesn't look too bad. 
So let's get on with that and uh, cue build montage. Now that we have both of them built, we can talk a little bit about the software to run on them. Now here you have two main options, either my code, which you can find at the GitHub link in the description, or you could use the sound reactive fork of WLED, which is maintained by Andrew Tulin, uh, which is also linked below. WLED is an excellent piece of software and was originally what I wanted to use, but I found that it's currently quite difficult to write your own patterns for it and to customize it in the way that I wanted it to work. So I've used the same hardware connections in my software as you have to use in WLED, so you can actually swap between them if you prefer one over the other. The code I'm using here has three main parts. The .ino file contains the main program, along with all the patterns. Then we have audioreactive.h, which is responsible for setting up the microphone and performing the FFT calculations to extract the frequency data from the audio. Now this code has been uh, borrowed, to use a nicer term, from the Sound Reactive WLED fork. I really hope Andrew doesn't mind me doing this, uh, but it would have been silly of me to reinvent the wheel when those guys have already done such a good job. Finally, we have webserver.h, which connects to a local Wi-Fi network to enable control of the VU meter. I decided to do it this way rather than have the ESP broadcast its own network, as I'll mainly be using this in the house and I don't want to disconnect from my main Wi-Fi to control the VU. I'll also sometimes want to use it outside the house, and so for this use case, I've added a secondary set of credentials, which in my case I'll set to the hotspot on my phone. That means at startup, it attempts to connect to the primary network for five seconds, and if this fails, it tries the secondary network for five seconds. If they also fail, it falls back to whatever setting it last had, uh, as this stuff's all stored in the EEPROM. Of course, every time it connects to the network, it has a chance of being assigned a new IP address. We could set a static IP here, but then we'd also need to set it up on the router. Now this is easy enough on a home network, but difficult when using a hotspot on your phone, for example. We get around this problem for now by displaying the address once it's connected, and so every time we switch it on, we see the IP scrolling across the screen. We just go to the IP address in a browser, on a computer or phone, for example, and we can change the settings, as you can see here. We can cycle through the patterns, set the pattern to auto-change every few seconds, and adjust the brightness, gain, and squelch. Brightness is fairly self-explanatory, but gain and squelch are related to the sensitivity of the audio input. So increasing the gain increases the sensitivity, but if you set this too high, you might notice the microphone picking up background noise. And in this case, we can increase the squelch slider to reduce those low level noises. To implement the controls, I've used WebSockets for two main reasons. Firstly, it allows simple two-way communication between the ESP and the web page. So for example, the web page can show you whether automatically changing the pattern is active or not. Secondly, it also allows two devices to be connected simultaneously, and if the settings change on one, they seamlessly update on the other. So you can see here I'm using Chrome and Firefox, and as I change the settings on one, it updates on the other one automatically. This method of control is not perfect, but it works well enough for my needs. Ideally, there'd be a captive portal to log into where you can enter the network credentials, then it automatically connects to that SSID. I'm absolutely not an expert on this web stuff, so if anyone wants to make the necessary improvements there and submit a pull request on GitHub, I'm happy to have a look at merging that. So any downsides to these devices other than the aforementioned faffing with Wi-Fi? Well, the main downside here, I think, are the charge boost boards. They both draw some current whenever the battery is plugged into them, regardless of if the power supply is switched on or not. And this means that you must use batteries that have over-discharge protection, as I don't really trust these boards to do that for me. Also, the larger 16x16 matrix really doesn't last very long on a 3000 mAh battery, maybe a couple of hours tops. I think I'd be better off getting a 7.4 volt LiPo and using a book converter to reduce the voltage down to 5 volts instead of boosting it up. 
If you want to make one of these yourself, the code and STL files are in the GitHub repository at the link in the description, along with links to the Sound Reactive fork of WLED, should you wish to install this instead. Remember, if you're happy not having it battery powered, it's somewhat cheaper to make, and if you do make one, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.